Well, good evening. Welcome to the program. This is Beacon Baptist Church. Wednesday night. Hard to believe it's April 28th, the last Wednesday of April. And May is right around the corner. I don't know about wherever you are watching from tonight. But here in Raleigh, it's heating up. 80, uh, mid-80s to uh, this day. And tomorrow, Thursday, it's supposed to be 90. And, man, bring on the heat, right? And uh, maybe our grass uh, will get burnt out before May. You know, who, who knows? Well, it's good to see you tonight. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast here at uh, Beacon Baptist again on Wednesday nights. Uh, we meet here in person for our adult Bible studies and at 6.30 p.m. And uh, so we like to uh, record our lessons uh, to, so those who are not able to attend uh, can still take part in it. We're so glad to have you. And throughout the whole program, you can feel free to leave comments uh, below. If you have a personal question for me, uh, you can reach me at my email address, E-R-I-C-F-O-U-S-T at beaconbaptist.org, Eric Faust at beaconbaptist.org. If this is your first time watching the program tonight, if you text the word guest, guest to 919-809-5558, uh, there'll be a couple of prompts there, and uh, we'd like to send you a little thank you, uh, our way of being a first-time guest. If you're curious what's going on here at Beacon, you can go to our website, beaconbaptist.org, and you can register for events, find out all kind of information, read the blogs, watch previous sermons, find out what the youth ministry, the college, the children, uh, the adults are up, up to. And you can find that information on our website as well as Facebook. And if you have your Bibles tonight, I'll be in John chapter 15. I won't tarry too long tonight. Uh, there's really four main uh, uh, lessons we're gonna, or points to go over this evening, but really I just want to cover one of them uh, to wet your whistle a little bit and to get us thinking, all right? story is told of a little girl who came from home from school and said to her mother, Mommy, today in school I was punished for something I didn't do. The mother ex 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 exclaimed, But that's terrible! I'm going to have to talk to your teacher about this. By the way, what is that you didn't do? The little girl replied, Well, my homework, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's so funny. How true. Hopefully tonight we'll uh, still do our homework, right? Absolutely. You know, it has been said that uh, life is full of teachable moments. If you'd agree with that, man, give it a little like button indeed. Uh, I agree with that statement. Life is full of teachable moments. Now, these moments come from all kinds of occasions, situations, and opportunities that uh, daily come across our path. These moments can help shape our thinking help change or modify our actions, and can even create a different motivation or a reason uh, to do a different thing a, a certain way. Often, these moments can come through one of two channels. Uh, these teachable moments, they either come from some kind of life experience, or many times it's through the voice or the action of a teacher. Liquid gold. Now, how many understand that you don't have to have teacher in front of your name to be one? For many, there are many people in your life who spoke truth into your life that didn't have a title in front of their name or a position that they held. By the way, let me say this. I am thankful for those who have chosen the teaching profession as a career path. It has been teachers who have made a great impact in my life and I believe in so many uh, lives of, of people. So being a teacher is, does, doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a title as a teacher. But in reality, God does allow many different teaching moments brought on by many different teachers throughout your life. I'd encourage you to take a moment to look back maybe to your elementary or your middle school, your high school years or junior high years as they were called uh, when I was in uh, middle school years, and think about your favorite teacher. Well, what, what was his name? What was her name? And I can go back a few. I know Miss Mrs. O from kindergarten, and she was a very sweet lady, and she had hair that went all the way down to her feet. And I remember Mrs. O was very kind. My second grade teacher, I remember, uh, Miss, Miss Ernst, and somehow I always won pizza parties in that class. That was a great year. And uh, there were some other years I don't want to mention because uh, uh, they weren't as good as others. And, uh, but uh, there are some sig significant teachers I've had. Uh, one was my eighth grade year, Mr. Taylor. Uh, they're at Bridgetown Middle School. 
and a wonderful man. And he really, he was, in my opinion, uh, one of the first teachers I felt like that, that really cared uh, about me and cared about my direction in life. And I'm thankful for him. And I had another teacher my middle school years who went on to become a UFC fighter, uh, Rich Franklin. And uh, to my knowledge at that time, he was the only Christian uh, teacher that I knew that I had ever had. Didn't mean that none of the other ones were not. I just didn't necessarily know it. And uh, But so thankful for those teachers in my life. I was reminded of that. I was invited uh, before uh, we came to Beacon. I was a, a pastor, a church planner there in Cincinnati, Ohio, Triumphant Baptist Church. And I attended Oak Hills High School. And uh, on a number of occasions, I was blessed to uh, be invited to speak at the baccalaureate service at our uh, public uh, high school. And I remember the very first one I had a chance to do there, uh, walking back down those hallways. Our school had around 3,000 or so in it, very, very large school. And uh, walking down the hallways, seeing some old pictures, you know, and things. A lot of memories came, came back, and I was blessed that night to stand uh, in front of about four or 500 uh, Oak Hills alumni and their uh, soon graduating seniors. A blessing was that uh, followed that baccalaureate service there inside the school. Uh, Mr. Brown, one of my sixth grade teachers, was there. And uh, we had a chance to catch up. And uh, he was saying, when he sat in the back, he said, I think I know that fellow. I had him in school. And, uh, uh, but what a blessing teachers are. What an impact they make in our life. By the way, teachers um, are a blessing. I'm thankful for them. So as you walk through the pages of Scripture, as you consider a scriptural approach to how God has designed teaching, as you walk through the pages of Scripture, you will find that God has instituted teachers all throughout our life. Consider with me for just a moment the teachers that are in your life. Parents, physical, literal, career path teachers, spiritual leaders, coaches, governmental authorities, those that serve in protect us. And the reality is there is a lot of people that hold positions or are in a position, whether it's a paid position or not, that have a lot of teachability and a lot of moments in which we need to learn a certain truth. Now, in every relationship that God has created, you will find teachers and you will find learners. But here is my question. What kind of teacher has God placed in our salvation relationship when it comes to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is this teacher-learner relationship simply a relationship with the church? Is it a relationship with a spiritual leader of some kind? Is it simply a relationship to the Bible? So the question does come down to if God has instituted teachers and from uh, all of our life people are put into our path and to speak truth into our life as teachers, what happens when a person becomes a child of God? Who is the teacher then? Is it the church? Is it only the Bible? Is it uh, some kind of spiritual leader? So who is our teacher and what are some things that he wants to teach us? Go with me one verse here tonight to uh, launch us out. It's John chapter 15 in verse number 26. The Bible says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. I'd like to speak on the subject matter here tonight. Things can't learn at school. Things you can't learn at school. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love you. God, I pray you'd guide us here, Lord, tonight. Thank you for those viewers who are able to attend, uh, Lord, the online platform we have. Thank you, Lord, for those uh, who are at home, I know, who want to be here. But, Lord, for many different health reasons, they cannot. And, God, we understand and we respect that so much. And I pray you just continue to heal them. Um, Lord, give them hope and, uh, during this time. And we thank you again for this way to be able to meet and converse in Jesus' name. Amen. As mentioned a moment ago, the relationship of a born-again child of God is different, but also very similar to many of the other relationships God puts into our life. As I mentioned a moment ago, you and I have had all kinds of teachers in our life speaking truth into us. And as you and I, if you have come to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
you'll begin to walk down a road of a new teacher-learner relationship. Now, it's, it's very interesting. God has not majestically, all of a sudden, when you become a child of God, he doesn't speak from heaven. He doesn't wake up every, wake up every morning and say, Eric, Eric, I need to put my John Wayne voice on. Eric, time to wake up. That was not John Wayne at all. Man, I'm a terrible John Wayne voice impersonator. I don't know who, who that was, but whoever it was, you're welcome. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, the point is this. The Bible goes on to tell us, and when it, or when it comes to this relationship, God has set forth a perfect order. We understand from the Bible that, that the God of heaven, Jehovah, the God of all, is a God of order. Nothing is ever done haphazardly. Nothing takes God by surprise. And God has set an order for, for the teacher and the learner when it comes to being a born-again Christian. Now, when you and I begin to consider that, we come to understand there in John chapter 15 into John chapter number 16 that there will be many things that the only way we will learn them is through the presence of the Holy Ghost in our life. Consider God uses human instruments to share his truth. Yes, he uses his word. But the truth is the Holy Spirit of God is uh, is the teacher. You see, I can preach and I can deliver truth, but only the Holy Spirit of God can impart truth. If you've got time, I'll give you a couple of verses to reference. Chapter 16, uh, verse number, well, let's just go ahead and read a little bit here. Verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell, you, I, I tell you the truth, and it is expedient for you that I go away. Why? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not of me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The truth is, the comforter in, in John 15 and John 16 is none other than the part, the third part of God's trinity, the Holy Ghost. Now, over there in chapter 15, in verse number 26, the word reprove we read in verse 8 means to convict or to convince. It's interesting, in this text, there's basically three things you'll never learn at school that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. The first is the truth concerning what sin really is all about. Number two, the truth concerning righteousness. righteousness. And the third, the truth concerning judgment. You know, the need of this hour, if as it has ever been, is truth. Truth is the issue here in this text. You know, there is a cowardice that is afraid of the truth. There is a laziness nowadays that accepts part of the truth. There is also an arrogance that thinks it knows all about the truth. But there is a true humility before God that opens the heart to receive what the Holy Spirit of God wants to teach you and wants to teach me. The truth is only, only when we have been saved can we know the three tremendous truths about sin, righteousness, and judgment. We begin to understand what sin is, what righteousness truly is, and what judgment is all about. Now we may understand them intellectually speaking, but we will never know them until the Holy Ghost of God teaches us these things. So for the next few moments, let me just kind of highlight, uh, let me give you the, the, um, the overview here, if you would, then let's just dive into one for time's sake tonight. We first will come to understand in John 16, 9, the truth concerning sin. Number two, uh, where do I want to write that down at? Let's see, it's on the next page, wait, no, it's not. Number two, the truth concerning, wait, I, I said that one right, sorry guys, the truth concerning sin. Number two, the truth concerning righteousness. What is righteousness all about? And thirdly, the truth concerning judgment. And so here for just a little while, we're going to just study this and try and get a few answers here to understand what the Lord is speaking of. So the Bible teaches us that, again, we are all sinners for three basic reasons. Now, I'm sure if you've been in church or read the Bible in, in, for any amount of time, you have come to the conclusion that you and I are either sinners or we're not. 
But what's interesting here, the three basic reasons I'd like to, let me give them to you, and then let's dive into them. Number one, uh, we're sinners for three basic reasons because of what we are. We are natural born sinners. Number two, what did I write that down? Let's see. I'm sorry. My notes are a little messed up here today. What did I do with that one? Hmm. Well, huh? I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> ah, got it. So, what happens sometimes? I like to print my uh, messages off. I print on one side, not two sided. This one I wound up actually printing off two sided, and it printed off on the wrong page. Number one. Let me start. Let me start again. Sorry about all that. Number one. Uh, we are sinners for three basic reasons. Number one, because of what we are. We are natural born sinners. Number two, because of what we do. Number three, because we believe not. So what does all of that mean? So go with me over to Ephesians chapter number two. Let's, let's, let's consider the statement that we are sinners because of what we are. Go with me to Ephesians chapter uh, number two, please. Ephesians chapter number two. There myself, Ephesians chapter 2. Notice with me verse number 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling what the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So it's very interesting here. The scripture lays out that we were children of wrath or children born under sin from birth. You see, the Holy Spirit has to remove a certain kind of ignorance, if you would, from our hearts. We think that men are wicked and sinful because of what they do. We think people are sinners because they lie or steal or commit adultery or something along those lines. But in reality, people are not sinners because they, they do those things, but they do those things because they are sinners. That's what we did. A man is not a liar because he tells a lie. He tells lies because he's a liar. A man is not a thief because he steals. He steals because what? He is a thief. Now, again, we live in a culture that is trying to remove the word sin, and we are, well, we're not naturally born Sinners is what they, they want to tell us when you go to the sodomy lifestyle, to the transgender lifestyle, to the uh, abortion. They don't want to use it. It's, well, it's just a, uh, a, a reproductive right and freedom and all these things because they want to take the words away. Now, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm a, normal, a normal guy just like anybody else. And yes, I may not like the concept or like to hear the fact that I'm, I am a sinner. But beloved, I want to encourage you. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I was naturally born a sinner. You didn't have to teach me to lie. God's blessing me with three beautiful children. And I've didn't, I have not had to teach him how to lie, how to do wrong, how to talk back, how to, how to go against the Ten Commandments. I didn't have to teach them that. There's something inherently on their inside that gives them a natural bend, an inkling toward sin. So the reality is, in our culture, many times we are trying to redefine sin out of, the, out, of exist, out of existence. But remember, the Bible still calls it sin. No matter what the news station wants to say, no matter even what churches want to change it to, at the end of the day, the Bible says, according to Scripture, one of the reasons the Holy Spirit has come is to reprove the world of sin. Because sin is a big deal to God. Sin is what took Jesus to the cross. So you say, Eric, what is the truth concerning sin it's because of what I mean by that, three statements, because of what we are, we are natural born sinners. Number two, be, uh, number two, uh, I wrote it here in the back, is also because of what we do. You know, go with me, uh, let's go to Romans chapter number three here. We're going to do a little bit of page turning here tonight. Get your fingers limber, get them, get them all ready to go. I tell you if, you, if you drink a bunch of these, all your fingers will be going excited, you know what I mean? <laughs> This is my second one today. You ever have one of the days too? I think I'm, I, I might wind up with three by the time the day's out. I don't know. It could be. It could be one of them days. But over in Romans chapter number three, in verse number ten, as it is written, "There is none righteous, no, not one." 
There is none that understandeth, uh, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So again, uh, when we say the term uh, sinner, what I'm saying is I'm a naturally born sinner. But I'm a sinner because I'm naturally born that way. Number two, I am a sinner because of also what I do. You know, our nature, if you would, is the poisoned well. The sins that we do are the poisoned bitter water that comes out of our own well. We may say that we don't kill or steal, but the truth is, or, or you know, we say, I don't kill or steal or commit uh, illicit acts. But when Jesus came, if you were to study what he said in Matthew chapter 5, you'll come to find out that Jesus didn't make it easier, he made it harder. The Bible says, if you hate a brother, it's like you murdered him. If you think a lustful thought toward another person, it's considered adultery. And so the point is, this, the point is this, Jesus did not make it easier when he came, he made it harder. You know, we have tried, as I mentioned a moment ago, to redefine sin to the point of redefining it out of our own existence. You know, um, the point is simply this, sin is sin. You know, God destroyed a civilization with a flood because of the imagination of men's heart in Genesis chapter number 5. And the truth is, sin is also something that we do. It's interesting, when you study the Old Testament, you'll find a couple words to describe sin. Uh, iniquity, sin. Uh, there's, oh, I, I just forgot my, I should have wrote this down, this is an extra point I just, I just thought of. But basically, when you go to look at what, what sins were uh, in the Old Testament, there's sins that I commit with my hands, sins I commit with my heart, and sins I commit with my head. And each of those sins can be different. They can be one of those three toward man or one of those three toward God. And each of those are judged differently how it works out. But the point is this, whether it's done vertically, whether it's done horizontally, sin is sin. And today you and I are naturally born sinners because of we're naturally born that way. Uh, sinners, number two, because of what we do, the things that we do, we have a bend toward. Though I know we don't want to call it certain things, but here's the point. We all have a bend that way. Number three, because we believe not. Now go with me to John chapter number 16, please. John chapter number 16 in verse number nine. It's interesting what Jesus says there of sin because they believe not on me. So again, the Holy Spirit is coming to reprove the world because of sin and the Lord highlights that phrase, because they believe not on me. You see, the Holy Spirit of God convicts us of sin, not only because of what we are and what we have done, but also because of what we have not done. We have not believed. There is a horrible condemning sin that most of the world never thinks about. That's the sin of not believing on Jesus Christ. So what is sin? In a nutshell, sin is a clenched fist in the face of God. Sin is failing to bow the knee to our Lord and Savior. Sin is high treason against heaven's king. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us this, these truths about sin. You know, we see that we have never bowed the knee to our maker, the one who died in agony and blood for us on the cross, and that we have ignored and spurred and refused him, then we will understand why the Bible calls us sinners. You see, unbelief is the greatest sin and is the parent sin out of which all other sins have grown. It was unbelief that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the Garden of Eden. A courtroom may convict us of crimes. Conscience will convict us of wrongdoing. But only the Holy Spirit of God will truly convict us of sin. When we understand that we have never really opened our heart and received Him as our Lord and Savior... Then we will seek his mercy. Again, what an amazing truth. The truth is this, as Jesus begins to speak on this particular subject matter about the Holy Spirit, one of the reasons the Holy Spirit is given is to convict the world of sin. Why? Because the world needs a Savior. I want to stop and just say this here tonight. Every person is born a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. God's not mad at you. God loves you. God understands our naturally born condition and he loved you and I so much that his only begotten son came as a propitiation, a payment for the sin that you and I deserve. 
And I want to so much encourage you here tonight that if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please reach out to me, Eric Faust at BeaconBaptist.org. I'd love to take the Bible and show you how the Holy Spirit of God will convict us of sin and point us to the Savior. Well, folks, I'll tell you what, we are out of time for tonight. I want to thank you so much for tuning into the program, and I pray God will bless you. If there's anything else we could do for you, please let me know. Have a great night. God bless you. See you soon.